Good afternoon, everyone. As Mrs. Santo said, my name is Amanda Decimito. I'm a senior, and my presentation is, or well, my project is titled Brain Death, s Nitrosylation, and Tissue Oxygenation. And none of this would be possible without my mentor, Lynn Zhu. So let's have a little round. Yeah. Yeah. First, some background. S nitrosylation is a process necessary and it regulates blood flow and tissue oxygenation. And brain death is a process when um, your brain loses all functions, including the brain stem. And when brain death happens, S nitrosylation is disrupted. And formally found in the Reynolds lab, ethyl nitrate, or ENO, can be used as a renitrosylating agent. Another big part of my project is vascularized composite allotransplantation, or a VCA. And when this happens, a chunk from a donor is then transplanted to a recipient, and that can include cells, muscle tissue, bones, and nerves, and other whatnot that may be included. And this is becoming a viable therapeutic option when there is, um, a, when there is needed a correction of major tissue loss or tragic injury. And a major source for organs is through brain dead donors, but however, during donor support, Organs often fail or deteriorate, and they're left unoperable. And so the methodology between or for a VCA, so first they have to induce swine brain death, and they do this by um, increasing the intracranial pressure in the head. And once the donor is deemed brain dead, they obtain a composite, which you can see in that second picture, and then they transplant that over to the recipient. And so this is just a picture of the before and after of a VCA. And so when the graft is contained, or when the graft is obtained, it looks like this. And then when it's transplanted over, you can see as it progresses, it swells a little bit. And then on day seven, it was taken out to be examined, and it looks like this over here. <coughs> and so to examine the results, so what we did was they compared um, a VCA between treating the muscles with ethyl nitrate and without ethyl nitrate to see if the tissue oxygenation would increase between the two surgeries. And so to do this, we ran a Western blot, but before we did this, we had to test the integrity of the muscle sample tissues. And to do that, we ran a BCA protein assay, and that just measures the protein concentration to make sure that we can still get viable results from our um, test. And so a Western blot is a form of gel electrophoresis, and after that, we got the images that you see down here. And the two primary enzymes that we were looking for were NAS2 and GAF-DH. And so because you can't really get much information just from pictures, we used a software called, called ImageJ, and that just helped quantify our results. And so from ImageJ, we compared the control to a VCA with ethyl nitrate and without ethyl nitrate. And as you can see, with ethyl nitrate, there is more snow compared to or s nitrosophiols and that just helps with s nitrosylation. And so you can see with a VCA with ethyl nitrate, there is an improvement in the levels. And another method we used was computerized microscopes. And so to do this, the muscle started off in a paraffin wax block, as you can see in that first picture. And they were cut into thin slices with a microtome machine. And then they were then fixated and mounted and stained so that you get this end result here, just like a microscope um, slide that you'd see anywhere else. And then we used this computerized microscope that was in the lab so I could take pictures and whatnot and examine them. And so this is some of the pictures that I took from the microscope machine. And so this was pig 15, which was treated with ethyl nitrate. And as you can see, this is the before and after, as it's labeled A and B. And so for part A, you can see that there is um, a lack of tissue oxygenation. A lot of it is spread out. It's not very compact. And then in part B over here, you can see it's a lot more condensed, a lot more put together. You can see the tissue oxygenation. And then up here, you can see there's a lot more purple than there is in there. And that just means there's more nuclei and there's more living cells there. And so same thing for pig 19. Pig 19 was also treated with ethyl nitrate. Um, you can see at the beginning, there is a lot of gaps between them. And then afterwards, you can see it's a lot more, um, it flows a lot more together, and there's a better oxygenation in the muscle. And then the la this is the last set of pictures, but so from pig 21, pig 21, I examined the graft and the recipients after it was put in and taken out. And so the graft, when it was taken out, it looks like this. So you can see it's very, 
like dry, I guess you could say, and it's not very living. But in the recipient muscle, there's a lot more color, it's a lot more alive. And so you, so which brings me to my conclusion that ethyl nitrate does replenish S nitrosic, ni nitrosic hemoglobin levels during a VCA. And so before I end my presentation, these are some pictures from over the summer. And I just want to share a little bit about my experience there. And so at the beginning of the summer, I came in knowing nothing really about HGI. I didn't really know what they stood for, what they were examining, what they were studying. But after a couple of weeks, um, I picked up um, a lot of the information. I was able to absorb a lot. And so it was a really nice experience for me because I never thought that I'd be working in a lab this young. And so it was very nice to have this introductory, I guess, like experience because it opens up a whole new level of, or a whole new field of science for me because I never thought that research could be fun like this. So if I could, I would go back. So, and these are my acknowledgements. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Haley Mjovic and I work with my mentor, Edwin. Stand up. <laughs> and our project is called S9 Translation of HbA1c. So to start off, I'm going to give you a background on type 2 diabetes. So insulin is a hormone that is produced by the pancreas and it opens up cells to allow glucose to enter and to be used for energy. So type 2 diabetes is a chronic disease in which cells in the body use do not use insulin efficiently, and that's called insulin resistance. Um, and that causes the pancreas to produce more insulin and to compensate for that resistance. But that results in an abnormal blood glucose level, and so the glucose starts to build up in the blood instead of going into the cells, and cells become starved of energy, and that causes high blood pressure, which, as you all know, is damaging to the body. So patients with type 2 diabetes may develop potential comorbidities, and the first one being peripheral artery disease. So with high blood pressure, the artery walls start to form plaque, and that limits the blood, blood flow, and that's called atherosclerosis. Um, a more advanced condition of peripheral artery disease is critical limb ischemia, and that's where blood flow is majorly reduced to the extremities, and that damages the tissues and may require amputation if it becomes too severe. And then heart failure is another one, and can, that's when the heart can no longer keep up to deliver blood and oxygen throughout the body. So here are some statistics on why type 2 diabetes is clinically relevant. The first one being that 25.8 million, which is more than 8% of the U.S. population, has been diagnosed with diabetes. 79 million, which is approximately 35% of adults 20 and older, have prediabetes, and most have not been diagnosed. And then, I want to draw your attention to the chart on the right. Um, of all the diabetes patients, 90 to 95% are type 2 diabetes, which is a very large chunk. So it's very important to do research on it. So hemoglobin A1c, or HbA1c is what I'm going to call it. Um, so to start off, I'm going to explain what hemoglobin is, and it's a protein found in red blood cells that carries oxygen throughout the body. And um, what hemoglobin A1c is, is hemoglobin that um, is chemically linked to glucose through a process called glycation. And because diabetes is based on an excess buildup of glucose in the blood, um, HbA1c is important in diabetes research and treatment. So there's two types of diabetes tests that can be done on patients. The first one being blood glucose test and an HbA1c test. Blood glucose tests are not always accurate because with diet you can change the glucose level in your blood within a week and it doesn't always show an accurate progression of their disease. But with an HbA1c test, hemoglobin lives for up to 12 weeks, or about 12 weeks and that allows you to like look back at um, look back and see the progression of the disease, and it's not affected by diet, like blood glucose tests are. Um, because high levels of HbA1c are indicative of an elevated blood sugar. And then my final point is that HbA1c is inversely proportional with snow hemoglobin, which I'm going to get into next. So S-nitrosylation. Um, 
what it is is protein modification that changes the protein's function. And proteins are made up of different amino acid chains. And this is an example of um, hemoglobin S nitrosylation, which is a very classic example. And the modification happens on the cysteine chain. So you can see on the diagram that we have an unaltered protein right there. And um, it has a free thiol, the SH thiol. And what happens is nitric oxide right here binds with it to form a snow protein. Where is it? Right there. <laughs> um, so when the modification happens, um, it delivers nitric oxide to the blood, and that widens the blood vessels and inc increases blood flow, and that's called vasodilation. So the procedure, what we did was called a snow rack, and that's short for S nitrosethiol by resin assisted capture. Um, so the goal of it is to see if there is a snow present in the molecule. So in this case, we want to see if HbA1c is S nitrosylated. So first, we start with a protein that has a binding site, that has three binding sites, actually. There's three thiols, the SH thiol, the snow in the middle, and then it has a disulfide bond. So we're only interested in this middle one right here. So what we have to do is block the other two. So you add MMTS, which is a reagent, to block the SH thiol. And then the disulfide bond is such a strong bond that it really doesn't show up in the snow rack, so you don't have to worry about that as much. And once you block the ones you don't need, um, we want to make sure, so what you have right there now, we want to make sure that that's a snow, that that's snow and not a different thiol. So we add a score bait right there, that's the next step. And that takes out the nitric oxide. So then after you do that, you add the beads and um, they bind to that hydrogen and then they stick and then you can run the gel. So on the bottom, you can see the final product of that whole procedure. On the left, that is before adding a scorbate right there. You can see that all the proteins were pulled down. And then on the right is the actual snow rack and only the modified snow proteins were pulled down. So the hypothesis was, does the glycation of hemoglobin cause hemoglobin dysfunction? So basically, when hemoglobin is turned into HbA1c, is it damaged in any way? And that led to the question, does hemoglobin get S nitrosylated? Which, in prior research, which I wasn't involved in, it was last year's research, um, they determined that it does get S nitrosylated. Yeah, Elena. That's part of that. <laughs> Raise your hand, Elena. <laughs> so this year, we wanted to focus more on is the S nitrosylation of hemoglobin A1C time dependent. So here are the methods we used. I'm going to condense a three-day process into two slides. So first, what we did was we prepared the beads. Um, we diluted the sample and then incubated. There's a lot of incubation that goes on throughout here. <laughs> and then we add acetone. This was my personal favorite part because the cold acetone <laughs> always cracked the tube. And that was fun. <laughs> I had to go quick. <laughs> and then we had to incubate again, <laughs> centrifuge, and then remove that acetone, and then sonicate. That piece of equipment made a very awful noise. And then we had to collect the input. And then incubate again, wash the beads, spin and load the sample into the gel, and then we stain the gel, and then analyze the measuring band's intensity. So here's a table of what we did. So basically, we had four samples, and the cisNO level stayed the same at five microliters, and the HbA1c level stayed the same at 125 microliters. What we changed was the time of cisNO incubation, so we had one at 5, 10, 15, and 20 minutes. And then here's some pictures. This is the um, gel that we ran. And you can see the protein starting to be pulled down, that blue stuff in there. And then this is me um, using a syringe to dry out the beads. So our results. This took a very long time to optimize. So at the top, you can see 
lost it. This is the input, and then this is the snow rack that we ran. So there's more to be done because ideally, we want to see the time dependence in the plus the score bait. So right here, this is the plus the score bait, this is the minus. And you can see that with out of score bait, you can see that time dependence. So at five minutes, it's very little, 10 a little more, and it starts to increase. But we want to see that right here, too. But we had good results, though, still because we saw that time dependence, even though it wasn't where we wanted it to be. Um, so with the pluses score bait, there wasn't enough beads, and a lot of protein was pulled down. So it was just too thick. So and that's the reason it was too, it was so thin in there, because there was no, not, or there was less beads in the minus of score bait. So there was not enough time to perfect this in the time that I was there. It's a very long process, as I mentioned before. And so the next steps, Edwin is going to be running the same procedure, and he's going to use less protein, so hopefully he'll see clear results in that area right there, because it's so thick. Um, but then that leads to the next question. After that is all perfected, is the S nitrosylation of HbA1c rate dependent? So at what rate is it S nitrosylated? And to determine this, Edwin will be repeating the experiment, and he's going to get back to me on how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, so I'm Grace, as she said, and I'm a senior. And uh, the project I worked on was with mentors uh, Jade and Aram, but they're both at college being smart. And, um, but I couldn't have been able to ha do this experiment without them, so they can still get a little round of applause. So. All right, so the project that I worked on was the characterization of nitric oxide synthase expression and endothel endothelial cell density during storage of human donor corneal tissue. That's a long title. <laughs> Uh, so a little bit about corneal, uh, corneal donations and like the benefits. So like a cornea is the outermost layer of the eye, which is kind of big. And uh, people lose their sight in many different ways, such as eye trauma and bacterial or viral infections. So like why even cornea uh, donations? They restore or preserve sight, and one person's cornea may help two people. And I was interested in working on this project because my mom actually had a cornea transplant, so I really wanted to learn more about that. So the, um, there were six pairs of corneas used, but I was only here for the last two pairs. So the, these are corneas pairs uh, five and six. Uh, so the aim of this project was testing if snow therapy can improve corneal viability during the storage period of 14 days. So a little bit over, overview about the procedure. So there was a total of six pairs of corneas, three of them um, will be used uh, at st like stored for the standard, standard period of 14 days, and then three of the pairs will be stored for 21 days. Um, one, one, of the, one was treated with ethyl nitrate, so eno, and one was untreated. So the samples were then sent to Eversight, like their main campus in Michigan, um, and the technicians transfer one cornea into, a pair of, into the pair, into the, the solution, and Eversight does not know which solution was treated, uh, while the Reynolds lab does also does not know which cornea was placed into which, which solution. And lastly, during the storage at Eversight, the corneas will be imaged according to the standard eye banks, like they took pictures of all the corneas that they um, sent over. And um, all the cornea, on the final day of the storage, vital staining was done on all the corneas used. So done in um, experiment before I was present, um, they found out that, that the addition of liquid eno increases snow levels in optisol for one week. So that's when we show the next graph. So this overall shows that um, snow levels are um, higher in the treated samples rather than the untreated after 14 days, and um, this kind of the snow helps with uh, cornea uh, preservation. So I was here, I got to take part in the vital stainings and help with like the program where they got to um, acknowledge which ones were dead cells and which ones were live cells. So they used the software, which was pretty cool. Uh, so this is the picture that Eversight took of the left, uh, left cornea of pair five. And this is like the, um, the software done image. And it shows the percent of dead cells and percent of live cells done. And then the right cornea image from Eversight, this is untreated. 
and it shows the percentage of dead cells and live cells. But these images, um, they're not very accurate because of the um, folds in the images given from Eversight because they show darkened areas which could have, uh, the program could have mistaken for dead cells instead of live. Uh, same thing was done for pair six. So the left cornea was treated, and then again, it shows the percentage of dead cells and live cells. Same thing for the right cornea, which is untreated. But um, these, one, these images had um, a little bit of issues in being accurate because of the folds and the lighting focus. So sometimes the lighting was darker, as in here, or really bright here. So it showed that there was a lot more live cells than dead cells, which doesn't make the um, image accurate. So then overall results of the vital staining is inconsistency because most of the images were unanalyzable, causing an inaccurate estimate of loss, cell loss. So Western blots and a qPCR, which is quantitative PCR, uh, data concluded that NOS was not detectable within the cornea pairs. But the overall qPCR results um, for, five and si for cornea pairs five and six resulted in a detection of gap DH, which that means they ran the Western correctly. Um, that means they um, isolated the RNA correctly as well. And, but the inconsistent CT values for gap DH within untreated and treated groups. So my experience, experience so during my time at um, HDI, I was presented with many new experiences, which was really exciting. I never thought I'd be working in a lab at the age of 17, and I got to like cut up my own like one of the cornea pairs, and I got to keep the little container that it came in, so that was really cool. <laughs> um, it allowed me to realize that, um, that I enjoy working with others and learning how to like put all of everyone's ideas together to come up with a solution. And then I have some pictures. And then my pictures. Okay. So my project was testing for markers of hypoxia in brain dead patients, and I worked with my mentor, Doohee Kim. <laughs> <laughs> so the purpose of our experiment was to test the hypothesis that markers of hypoxia, BCL2 and NF-kappa B, are upregulated in brain dead patients. The inflammation of tissue in brain dead patients will reduce um, oxygen flow to muscles and that's what causes hypoxic conditions, which is just the lack of oxygen that is able to flow into uh, muscle tissue. And BCL, BCL2 and NF-kappa B, which are the, um, the two protein coding genes that we use, are known to be upregulated in humans during hypoxic conditions. And we would analyze these using uh, Western blots. So the methods for a Western blot, which I will summarize very uh, briefly, is first we would dilute the protein samples using like a buffer and dye to, to, um, so that it could stain the gel. And we would take the gel tank and load the protein samples, which would be connected to electrodes and left to run. And after the run would finish, we would remove the gel and place it onto um, a semi-dry transfer apparatus, which is shown on the left here. And so that it could transfer the stains from the gel onto a nitrocellulose membrane, so that that could be analyzed um, so when the transfer was finished, which is shown here, these are the gels on top of the membranes that they got transferred onto. So after this transfer was finished, the samples were left to rock in milk so that, the, um, so that it could like, better adhere to the membrane. And they were washed with reagents so that they could be analyzed. So these are the pictures of the membranes that we took. On these two here on the left are the GAP-DH membrane results, which we use GAP-DH because it's a gene that's uh, known to, we use it as a control because it's known to show up in every condition. And um, on the right here, the top two are NF-kappa B and the bottom two are BCL2. So for our results, uh, it showed that NF-kappa B were upregulated in all four of our samples, and BCL2 was upregulated 
in only sample 52 and 55 as shown at, on the graphs. Right. So in conclusion, uh, the oxygen flow to muscles and brain of patients is limited, resulting in hypoxic conditions that will upregulate upregul up the markers for hypoxia like nf kappa b and BCL2 because it was shown that these markers were upregulated in the muscle samples that we used. So in conclusion about my experience, it's really a once in a lifetime opportunity and especially for someone who's interested in a STEM field or even just research or medicine or anything like that, it's a great way to be exposed to this and it really did build my interest in STEM fields and it also allowed me to um, build great relationships with my mentors and classmates and I was able to grow a lot as a student in general and even as a person I think by working as a member of a team and um, learning new things every day that I was there and interacting with a lot of different situations that I never would have been exposed to otherwise. And I really think that the lessons that I learned are invaluable and I'll definitely carry them with me through college and <laughs> the rest of my life. And I'd like to close <laughs> with a quote from Haley actually. <laughs> it's just a message from the lab to everybody else. It's that quitters never quit. <laughs>